Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 256 for Monday, May 18th, 2020. folks and welcome back to gig gab the show by for and about working musicians here still of course in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton here in san jose california it's paul kent hey man so uh hey man thanks for the week off last week yeah 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 you're, you're welcome <laughs> i try not to be a slave driver during these times you know it's how it goes. <laughs> we um we have now done two of the bitter pill live streams of our album release that I, I was talking about that we were sort of formulating. Um, and, and both of them have suffered technical difficulties. Uh, so I feel your pain, Paul, because it's, it feels like, you know, like both times we've gotten together for like 90 minutes the day before sussed it all out. It's like, Oh, this is going to be great. And then suddenly we go to do it and it's like, you know, 10 minutes before we're supposed to go live. It's just been like a disaster. And yeah, uh, yeah it's audio interfaces. Uh, you know, when there's six people, there are six different ways of connecting. And, and then there was a problem with, there was a, there actually, I think there still is a problem with Mimo live where version 5.6, the, the streamed video gets out of sync with the audio. So that's fun. Uh, oh yeah, they came. They announced that the other day, right? They're uh, aware of that and they're working on it. They are aware of it and working on it. I thankfully was able to roll back to five point five this week, and it it's totally fine. So, um, but we had you know we had other issues. I mean, there's always there's always issues, and plus I'm changing my setup here all the time because we're in like quarantine land, and so what else can I do but buy gear to can continue expanding my studio? Because now that I'm on. Right. I'm on my full digital mixing thing. It's like, I got to get more stuff. So I have stuff to talk about, Paul, but let's first talk about um, something that's a topic that's come up in a couple of different ways. And that is this whole idea of um, playing cover songs or quite frankly, even playing your own music on, uh, on YouTube and Facebook. We, the first week we didn't have any trouble with the bitter pill live stream because the album had not been released yet. And, but then once it was released, we started having problems because Facebook and YouTube both said, Hey, uh, your video includes copyrighted music. So you can't, uh, you can't publish that. Or you if you publish do your own stuff, well, they don't know that it was our own stuff. So we had to uh, file, we had to, yeah. How would they know? Right. Like, you know, right? yep. so we had to file, with, I think I, I'm, I'm not handling the right stuff and the, the distribution of it, but I think we're doing it through CD baby. And if we're not, it, it effectively is the same as them. You just go to whoever's doing your, your distribution and, and registering you and all that, and just tell them to mark exclusions for your How long specific it take? page a day, maybe two. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're pretty good about it. Yeah. So, and then it, then it all kind of loosened up, but, um, but it does bring up an interesting conversation because uh, w whether you're playing your own music or someone else's music, it, it very likely is that you are playing licensed music in your live streams or shows. And Facebook and YouTube both deal with it differently. And wait, wait, let me pause you here and ask you a question. Are you making a distinction between copyrighted music and licensed music? No, same thing. I mean, I, I suppose it's po well, yes, because it's possible that music is copyrighted, but isn't licensed into the digital domain. So for example, uh, you know, I don't think our, our theme song is copyrighted music, but I don't think it exists anywhere in digital form, uh, in a, in a, in terms of for sale in a digital form. So I don't think you, t we have permission to use it by the way, from Mark Lint. So that's all good. But, uh, but you know, it, in theory, YouTube doesn't know that Mark gave us permission to do this. Right. right? You know, so, uh, the, the issue is when you have music that's, you know, part of whatever the, the algorithms compare to the music genome project, probably this is probably a big one that they're using. So no, but, but in general, no copyrighted and licensed. I'm sort I'm using them interchangeably. So, so when you say music genome project, you're actually saying that these services, these platforms, yep. Use Music Genome Project to do digital comparisons of, uh, you know, what, however that works by comparing melodies or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. But um, they're using some technology to take a piece of 
content and run it against uh, a library of known things. And then they send you a note saying this is not cool. There's not there's not some person. No, that's police. That's policing this. Stuff. No. And that's part of the problem is that it's not a human being. So they sometimes get it. The algorithm sometimes gets it wrong. But more often than not, when it gets it wrong, it doesn't flag it. It. I've never seen it incorrectly flag something. Uh, it, any time that I've gotten a flag for things, it's, it's always been correct. Uh, now I, I, before we get deep into the, the, uh, the electronic version of this, I kind of want to zoom out for a second because as if, if you play in a cover band or quite frankly, even if you play in an original band, uh, you know, you are going and playing your songs, you know, prior to when we were all streaming, you're going and playing your songs or, or someone else's songs live in a club somewhere. And the same rules apply in general in that the people who wrote those songs need to get paid. Get paid. Yeah, yeah. And they deserve to get paid. Right. Like that's, right. that's cool. ASCAP, BMI and CSAC, S-E-S-A-C are the agencies that facilitate these rights payments. Uh, and generally speaking, they uh, work with venues. So, you know, the bars, the clubs, whatever. Uh, and those venues pay a fee, monthly fee, quarterly fee, something to each of these agencies, usually because a song is generally copyrighted or represented only by one of those three agencies. Uh, but chances are it'd be, it'd be really weird to, to only play songs that were ASCAP songs as opposed to BMI songs. Cause it's up to the artist, which, you know, which agency they rep them uh, with. So the, the, the bars, uh, um, there's a formula that they use and they look at how many nights you have music and that could be live music or played over the PA. Right. And, uh, and then or they look months. at the, the size of the room and all of that. And they say, okay, you owe us, X amount per month or whatever. And then that covers the bar for all of this in all of those situations. And ASCAP even has a, uh, a thing on their website about this. It is not up to the musicians to pay. It is up to the clubs. And in fact, there's not a scenario where the club can, can shift their responsibility to the musician. So if you ever get a contract with a club that says something about, uh, you know, you're responsible for paying licensing fees. It th That's not correct. There, the, the, you and the club could make that agreement, but ASCAP is never going to collect the money from you. They're going to go after the club owner, regardless of what arrangement you've made with the club owner. So, uh, and, and we've got some links to that that we'll put in the show notes. So there's that. And now we're streaming on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and this is where it gets interesting because Facebook and YouTube and Twitch and Instagram and, you know, any other streaming platform in a sense, they are the venue. They're right? venues. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's up to them to pay the rights management agencies and all of that. Now, what they have that your general, you know, run of the mill nightclub doesn't have is as we were talking about before, the ability to truly zero in and say, I know that it not just was that there was a song played, but it was that song. And it was that version of that song, right? If it's a, if it's, if it's a, you know, pre-recorded version or if it's just a cover, I've had YouTube pick up covers that Fling has played, uh, you know, from live and, and mark them. So uh, they can do that and they can pay rights. Now YouTube handles this, I think in a, a fairly, fair and uh, diplomatic way when you put up a stream or something, a video that has copyrighted music in it, you get a little email. And generally the email is starts by saying, this does not count as a strike against you, which is good. Mm -hmm. And then they say, okay, um, look, there's this, this song in there that, uh, that someone else owns the rights to, and you can appeal it if you think it's your song, or you can choose to have it muted if you don't want us to do anything with it fine or you can choose to let it play exactly as you have it in the video but we're going to monetize that video on our end and then we're going to take that money some portion of it of course and send yeah. it across to the the you know the rights holder and, and via ASCAP BMI CSAC and get them get the money to the you know the songwriter or the person that owns the rights and that you know that works out really Seems civil it's very civil facebook is a bad venue in this regard they've tried 
to there, a couple of years ago, there was a thing where they were trying to work with, I forget who it was. It was, um, royalty exchange posted a thing about it. Um, they were, I mean, they were paying, I forget who it was. Oh, they, they, maybe it was oddly a U D D L Y that they were working with or something like that, but they, um, they tried and they paid a bunch in royalties, but for whatever reason, that deal seems to have fallen apart. So Facebook just doesn't have a mechanism in place to be a good venue like YouTube. Wait, are you saying so ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and Facebook are heading for a problem? I think they don't have a relationship is what it is. So but those lawyers for those licensing companies, they want their money, right? Well, it, which is why Facebook just shuts down your, your streams. If, oh, got it. Because Facebook doesn't have a way to pay them. That that makes Facebook happy anyway. I thought you were saying that Facebook doesn't want to pay. No, Not that they don't have them. No, they they. So that's why they will just you know mute that part of your video, and you don't have any way of unmuting it unless you can prove that you own the song, right? Then then you can then it's fine. But unless you can prove that, near as I can tell, there's no there's no like yeah go you guys go ahead and monetize it and and pay them and and just leave my video up please, right? That's hmm. yeah, yeah. So seems like once the model was established by YouTube, it wouldn't be that hard for them to, to, you know, basically duplicate it. Just duplicate problem, it. Right. I, I, yeah. I agree with all the things you're saying. Yep. But it doesn't look like that's how it is. So. I've never had a, I've never had a video taken down. I've, you know, I've posted lots of covers. Mm. I've never had something taken down. Never had something questioned. You are do the covers well enough. Yeah, you're you are you're <laughs> lucky. I mean, I I I know people in your position, and I know people that are very much in uh, the other side of it, where it's you know they um it. it I wonder if just, once you once you catch their eye, what, yeah. whether they watch your account. That you that might be it. If you run afoul of it, you know, more than X number of times in Y number days, then they you know maybe pay more attention. I will say that YouTube clearly does more processing on their videos than Facebook does. And, and the, well, not clearly, I think they do. And the reason I think that is, you know, we stream, we now stream that the uh, other podcast I do, Mac geek gab live. And when I finish streaming, I, you know, I end the streams on both platforms at the same time, but I want to cut out the pre-show and post-show sort of banter. It's fine to have it there in the live stream, but you know, for the, the, the version that's preserved for the record. I just want what you folks get like on the stream or on the, when you download this podcast, just the, you know, the actual part of the show that we wanted to record and both platforms let you trim your video down Facebook. I can do that trimming within about five minutes of finishing the stream. And it's absolutely complete within an hour. Uh, no problem. Everything's good. Pushed out, you know, wherever they have their platform servers and all that stuff, it's done. YouTube, well, let's see, yesterday we did a stream. We finished at about 12.30 p.m. At 11.30 p.m., I still couldn't edit the stream. It, like, it wouldn't even let me start editing. And then, so I did it this morning. And, you know, once I woke up at, like, 7 o'clock or something, and then it took another, you know, three hours for it to get there. So either YouTube is just deprioritizing that stuff or they're doing a whole lot more crunching on things and maybe yeah. this is part of it. So it could be a server capacity thing for Facebook for sure. You know, they're I not a video know, platform. They, well, they are though, but they I are mean, now Think of all that Facebook right. live. Yeah. Right. I mean, think of the number of people who are streaming mindless, constant video. And uh, <laughs> that's, I think that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, but it's it's interesting. What I digging into this though, I realized something, man. And and it's this is hugely valuable to anybody that writes and goes and plays their own songs. You can get paid by ASCAP when you play your song in a bar. And all you got to do is upload your set list to ASCAP and BMI and CSAC are have similar mechanisms and I've, I'll put links in the show notes to everybody. But um you, you, you know, you register, okay, well, here's the set list from our gig and you put your covers in there so that those people get paid and you put your originals in there and the stuff goes to the rights agency. Remember, it's not you that's paying ASCAP, it's the club. And right. so, you know, you get your slice of that, you know, your tiny little slice of that very small pie. But if you're planning, I mean, you know, hey, every little bit, right? Revenue stream, mm -hmm. might as well open it up. So... And it charts as plays and maybe that, you know, can help you. And I don't know if somebody's looking at that stuff, maybe that helps. I don't know. So 
I had no idea that this was a thing we could do. So, hmm. yeah, I know. So we'll put those links in there. But uh, oh. I'm glad you haven't been been messed with on this, man. I'm sure I will right after this. Well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on this one? Any other thoughts on your stuff? I mean, we've got gear to talk about and, and techie stuff, which is fun. But, you know. No, I think we should move to gear because okay. I'll tell you. You know, over time here, sheltering in place, I am a, I am acquiring a lot of stuff. You know, I, I my life now, you know, I'm head down in Logic. I'm head down in Final Cut, you know, putting v- videos together. I bought a looper. Yeah. I am, bought some microphones, you know, to try to, and, you know, trying to get better at this whole streaming platform thing is, is fascinating to me. I do, I don't know about you. I think, I think that's going to be all we have for a little while. I mean... <sighs> I think through the summer, at least. Maybe. I, I mean, I'm, I, I assume you're right and I'm not getting my hopes up or I'm at least not letting myself get my hopes up because realistically, that's what it seems like. However, as of well today, in fact, uh, the state of New Hampshire and I think Vermont and Maine are either also today or already doing this. Restaurants can be open with outdoor seating only reserved seating Lots of very specific rules about social distancing and, you know, how many tables you can have. And there's got to be six feet between tables and the the way the staff has to, you know, maneuver. And there's no waiting for a table. It's, you just show up and sit, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but it would seem to me if you've got, say, a restaurant with a nice big deck or something, um, you could choose to have live music. And I know venues that we've talked with some that are very, you know, seriously considering that, um, because, because they, they, it might be a way to kind of keep people there and, you know, keep them drinking and, and obviously that keeps the money flowing. And so, you know, all the normal things apply. So it, it's interesting. Our gigs for May were canceled at most of these outdoor venues that we wind up playing, especially the acoustic stuff with, with monkey fist. But, uh, and I know some people that are like our June gigs have not been canceled. And I know somebody that played a gig a week ago at like outside at a, uh, like a market kind of thing. It's sort of a New Hampshire market ish where, where they're just doing curbside, but, yeah. um, but it's a big farm. There's a lot of land there. And so they had, uh, my friend Dave Gerard and his bass player, they were, you know, eight feet away from each other or whatever. And they uh, they were just playing some kind of acoustic kind of tunes and rocking out and people, yeah. people were chilling. So I think there's opportunities, I, maybe. So Simon uh, from the House Rockers just got called to do one of his gigs at a local hotel. They have a courtyard. Yeah, okay. Very big courtyard. The tables already are at least 20 feet apart from each other. It's very you know, sure. chill. There, there's a couple of community couches around a fire pit that I'm guessing that they won't use or they'll only let one one or two people, you know, I and they will figure those things out. A cat I know, um, he did a weird thing the other night. He played on a, on a Friday night at a barbecue place that said, well, it's takeout. You can come catch a little bit of the music while you're waiting to get your takeout mm. socially distance. Sure. You can look through the window of, you know, from outside uh, and you can, you know, go in the parking lot and be in your car and, you know, that, yeah. it just seemed odd to me, but it, I think it was an attempt on a few things. I have really, before we get into gear, I do have an interesting question for you. Yeah, so sure. um, those people, you know, who are slowly doing things, are they playing at their scale of what they were getting before or reduced scale? And I'm asking this question because yeah. there's been a lot of, uh, I know almost as soon as this happened, I know a lot of musicians who out of the good of their heart started doing uh, benefit streams where tips went to the venues. I oh, did one right. of those actually. Yeah, you did. That's right. I did yeah. one of those just cause it's one of, it's my favorite venues. I'm assuming that's what other musicians did as well. Um, you know, I'm I'm interested in in how much of the sharing of the pain. Now remember, we've had many conversations here about how the general relationships that are often had between venue owners and and musicians they can be good, they can be bad. There's usually some degree of of business like decision making somewhere in the middle. Did, yeah. How how many people did you bring me? How much booze did you sell in mine? How much coffee did you sell in mine? Whatever it might be. And I'm really right, right. interested and curious in hearing 
you know, already this is screwing so many live gigs. I'm wondering if you have any experience or any knowledge of whether there's even more downward pressure uh, that that the venues are like, well, you know, there's just not enough business to afford this. I'll have it if you want to play. And then once again, will the music, the musician faction be taking, I mean, you know, the concept that musicians are making less than what they made 30, 40 years ago per, per man per gig right, is right. absurd, right? Does this further squash that, put it down? I don't know. So anything that I'm about to share is pure speculation on my part. I have no idea if Dave Girard got paid by, by Emery Farm where he played that gig. Um, it would not surprise me if he did that for free. Um, you know, and, and I could come up with a variety of reasons why that would be the decision someone might make, you know, Dave or anybody else. But I don't know. I haven't heard of anybody getting you know, paid for a gig yet, but it's all so new, right? It is. So, uh, but, but I think you're right. You know, even when we had, you know, in the last episode and we had Brad Maddox on and, and he was talking about how, you know, the guarantees for big touring acts were not going to be there. It was going to be a sharing in the, you know, in the door, kind of a reset on the industry at that level back to, back to where it, you know, where it was uh, decades ago. And it would not surprise me if we see a similar reset here. And I'm not convinced that that's a bad thing. Um, sharing the door, you know, as I, I still feel like whenever things truly are, you know, wrapped up with this and, and I realize, you know, there's a big asterisk there. We may never be <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, there's no going back to the way it was, but whatever the right. new abnormal, when, once we're out of the new abnormal and we're into the new normal, uh, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot more interest from people in going out. Uh, there certainly seems to be that demand building and i think you know pent up is a good phrase to use uh, because a year from now people are going to want to go out and and you know hang out on decks and party and all of that stuff and i think that could be really good for the live music scene in general for the clubs for the bands for everybody involved so if it, i think where we we as musicians need to be careful is to be good business people and not let our pent up demand to get out and play cause us to form bad deals. Uh, right. You know, if somebody says, look, we're not going to pay you a guarantee for the night. Okay, fine. Well, let's talk about where you are going to make your money for the night. And, and, and let's do that. You know, I used to play gigs where I got a hundred percent of the door, the, the band, not, you know, not just me, uh -huh. um, a hundred percent of the door and 20% of the bar. Now that seems realistic. That's pretty great. Yeah. It was, no, those were good gigs. Like, you know, high school, <clears throat> early college. That's like, that was a, that was the norm for us. And we yeah. would walk out of, you know, gigs with a five piece band with, you know, a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks or whatever. And that was totally yeah. normal. So then that went away. Right. And, and I think we can all speculate as to why it went away because it could have, you know, there were bands that were willing to play for less. And so yeah. th that's what happened. And that's actually what I worry about in this conversation. Yeah. Dave, you say you know, musicians should be good businessmen. Well, just in general, musicians are not, not good businessmen, no. right? They're happy to have a gig. They're happy to be able to do their art. And, you know, we don't think about the the rolling downhill effect right. of lowering the pay scale again and again and again. I mean, in, you know, the most common thing we ever hear is that, you know, with bar gigs, that ever since smoking laws and drunk driving laws tightened. Yep. Um, you know, that, but I know when I play, you know, at least two of the regular gigs we have are full yeah. butts to elbows all the time. That's it, I right? Get door, I get the door at one of those. Okay. And I, you know, it would be an interesting thing from a purely business standpoint to say, well, listen, I'm packing your club. I should, I'm entitled to, you know, some of the, some of the bar money. I, the, the owner would lose his mind if I, if I <laughs> you know, cause it's just, it's not done. Right. It's no, but it's, he would then have a, but yeah. from a purely business standpoint, you know, put on your business hat, He'd be like, well, you know, if I can get over the indignancy of someone being that aggressive with me and just think about the dollars and cents of it, well, if he leaves, the next guy only brings in half the people. I'm still making more with this guy. Yep. You know, uh, but those are those are weird conversations. Th that's, to have it's hard to keep emotion out of it. As much as we say it's business, don't get emotionally tied to it like that. It's, you know, 
that it's difficult in any business, not just the, the music business. You know, somebody comes to you and says, I deserve more than you're paying me. That's, you know, you're going to, yeah. you're going to have a reaction. To that. You're going to react to that. Yeah. But the, the point of all this again is I saw musicians largely rush to the support of their favorite venues. Right. And, and, you know, play a night, put the, and, and it's actually one of the reasons I've had a hard time figuring out when I, I've done streams almost every week and I haven't figured out what I want to do about tipping yet. Everybody else is doing tipping when they weren't doing, you know, and I'm one who says m music has value and, you know, should be paid for. Here we are and every so, week. Yeah. But, but I, but I can't figure out, you know, all right, the same people I know are, are trying to, you know, visit six or seven streams a week. They would never have gone to six or seven gigs a week, right? Right. Do I want to be another guy, you know, going into people's pockets? Or in my for my brand, do I want to kind of set it aside and without create will that lower my value or that it raise my value? I don't know the answer to that yet, but I haven't gotten comfortable with it. I know that I, I think I've talked about this guy that I really have gotten into his streams, Tim, Tim Bloom from the Mother Hip. So this is, you know, a successful guy. And, you know, but but not like not yeah. like chart topping successful, but sure. you know, a, a a working, you know, a working musician bought a house for music, I'm sure. Anyway, he he asked for tips. And I'm like, well, if he's asking for tips, why shouldn't I ask for tips? And so I haven't figured out what I want to do with the, you know, to to establish the value. I have to figure that out. But my point being more, it's just this sense of downward pressure. Yes, if the venues go away, there is no there's no venues, right? If there's no venues, there's no place to play. And, but, but is it the musician's job to uphold that by taking less than what they're worth? Right. And, yeah. and I think we're, we're going to see some really, you know, I, I, I would imagine your friends aren't getting paid. I don't know if I I'm guessing Simon's getting paid. I don't think he would go and do it if he wasn't. Right. But is the pressure going to be from smaller businesses? Hey, everything's changed. I can't see this many people in the restaurant. It seems like obviously this is the conversation that's going to happen. That, that later, sounds right? like a realistic conversation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But then again, if people, if, you know, referring back to that pent up demand, if there's people right now that are like, I don't care what it costs. I want to safely Go sit on a deck outside, sip a, you know, fruity drink and watch my, you know, watch somebody play some cover tunes and, and some Jimmy Buffett on an acoustic guitar. Uh, you might be able to charge more for your cover by playing that same logic if you're a, a restaurateur, right? Like, look, well, I used I used to be able to fit 100 people in here. Now I can fit 30. And so if I used to charge you five bucks or nothing, now I need to charge you 12 just to walk in the door. I need to have a yeah. two drink minimum or, you know, like that there is a, it's not just here between clubs and bands where this conversation needs to happen. It, it can happen everywhere. I mean, I don't know about you, man, but my grocery store prices are through the freaking roof right now. Right. right? right so, right, right. so we're all used to paying a little more right now. We're not happy about it, but th that goes away. You know, it, once you become accustomed to it, you just stop stop complaining. Is all it but is. But music and musicians always seems to be the first one to go to the oh, race to the bottom, right? Yeah. And that that's and and what you said actually makes sense to me. So I I play several places where there is no cover, right? Right. right. So music is a draw to sell whatever the place is selling. And I was actually thinking. So tell me what you think of the, this. Is I actually think that like my coffee shop gig, which I love, really is rewarding. And pays well and tips well. I'm actually wondering whether the model now, since she needs to take some tables out of there, should everything be a ticketed show? Right. I mean, you can't have lines outside. No, it has to so, be. You got to have a reservation, no matter what. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yep. So I'm, you know, I, I actually want to talk to the woman who owns the coffee shop about that, and you know, see if that works. I think I've got enough draw. I think people want to go out. You know, yeah. if it's safe. And, if, you know, if the, and that's the thing, the total communication to people is like, we're changing things We're you know, we're going we to cover, but, right. but yeah, but you're, you know, six feet away. And again, I, again I, yeah, well, and now is the in, time here in Northern California, 10 bucks is not going to kill anybody. I mean, nope. I realize that more people are out of work, you know, and, and there, there are, are changing economic situations, but it was amazing to me that, that some bars were charging a $5 cover, five, 
dollars. Yeah. Why? Why bother? Right. 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 I mean, if somebody's coming in and they're going to buy a couple of drinks, you're in. And we had this conversation, you know, even in, in the least, bucks. Ex- even if the least expensive area of the country, you're at 15 to 20. That's right. Yep. yep. I know. It's crazy. Yeah, but now is the time to have those conversations with your favorite, you know, places to play and and start that that because they might not be thinking of this and they might not even realize, wait, I can charge my patrons a little more, uh, you know, or I can charge a cover where I, I previously just never even thought of that. Having that conversation can help protect your income folks down the road. So, you know, yeah. just reach out. People people yeah. are sitting at home. They're doing nothing. So, you know, now's the time. All right. Speaking of sitting at home and doing nothing, we've been, uh, we've been going nuts. I've been going nuts with gear, but I, I know I can speak for both of us. So, um, I'll, I'll couch this conversation by starting and just talking about, uh, the, the, the DAW that I use is logic. I'm a Mac guy and, uh, and I've been using logic pro 10 for a long time. Well, uh, last week, Apple released logic pro 10, 10.5, which is Paul. It's the 28th free update to logic since 2013 when logic pro 10 was released so yeah. yep it's a it's a 199 bucks to buy it unless you're somehow involved in the education world and then for that same 199 bucks you can get it's the it's like the education five pack that, that's not what they call it but it's logic final cut pro compressor main stage and uh, motion uh, so if you're a mac person doing any sort of creative work and you have that angle take it but I mean, um, up on a time logic was nine ninety five. I mean, yeah, I'll remember that. Yeah, it was a thousand bucks. That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, but the the new version, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, well, they've added some cool things, but none of these are for me because they added live loops to Logic, which is somebody at Apple's probably going to scream at me, but but talking to a crowd of musicians, it essentially brings Ableton Live like features and functionality into logic. So you can attach samples and loops to uh, pads, and then you can sort of trigger those pads in, in any way you like and manipulate them, but it's all inside of logic. So you can, you're creating these, these sort of loops, and then you can also record them and add logics effects to them and all of that. It's not a separate thing. It's all integrated. Uh, and it's pretty cool where it gets really cool is that they've got a new sampler in there and they've got an auto sampler now. Uh, so for example, I could sit at my drums and play a groove and feed that into the sampler and it would strip everything apart, quantize it, make a MIDI track of it and then play my groove back. But now because it's in logic, I can move things around and do cool stuff mm. with it. Uh, I heard a story about somebody, Paul, that, had had recorded his mother playing his late mother playing their grand piano that they had in their house growing up. And he always wanted to make a sample of it uh, to, you know, a patch to use, but mm-hmm. it's a big pain in the neck to do that. Well, it was, but now with the, the new stuff in logic, he just fed it the audio file and let it kind of go to town for a little while and came back and boom, now he's got a, um, uh, you know, an uh, electronic version that can be assigned to any MIDI, you know, input and boom, he's playing what sounds like his mother on that grand piano, which is pretty cool. So there's cool things in here and it's definitely worth checking into logic, but you can always go a little bit further. I will say this logic's plugins are f- some of the best in the world. If you know how to use these kinds of plugins and this is where I've been really impressed with a company called Isotope. Uh, they've been around for a long time, Paul. They make plugins for all kinds of... So now we're sort of outside the Logic world. They make plugins that work with Logic, but they also work with pretty much every uh, DAW, Mac, or Windows that you could use, right? They, they make them for everything. And there's two that I've been playing with. And the first is Neutron 3. And it, for lack of a better term, it's a channel strip. And what I mean by that is... It's all of the things that you would add to your, your gain staging, right? So you, you, you plug your mic into your audio interface or your instrument into your audio interface. And then from there, you decide, well, do I want to use some EQ? Do I want to use some gating? Do I want to maybe DS my vocals to make them not so harsh? Do I want to use compression, right? That whole structure of what you're going to use and in what order you're going to use it now is your job to figure out. Unless you're using Neutron. 
you can do it all manually. You can use their presets or you can use their mix assistant, which is, this is the amazing part. You, you tell it, okay, I want to use the assistant. Great. It asks you a couple of questions. You want it, you know, what kind of instrument is this? Or do you want me to try to figure it out? Or, and, and, you know, what kind of sound are you looking for? There's two or three questions. It's not very much. And then it, you play the track and it listens to the track and comes up with a starting point based on what it's hearing and all of the, you know, the, the answers that you gave to your questions. And what a great learning tool this is because mm. you, you get to see, you're not just starting from like baseline with, you know, you turned on a compressor. Okay. Well now what? Well, where do I set the crossover if it's going to be a multiband compressor? I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, like all of that stuff. And I've really found it fascinating to learn with and just see what it comes up with. And it's like, oh, I never would have thought. I, this is going to sound stupid to anybody that actually knows anything about recording. But I always put my gate first, then my, uh, my compressor, and then my EQ. Because I thought, well, we'll gate out, you know, all the noise. We'll compress it and then we'll EQ what's left. And Neutron reversed it and it put EQ, then gate, then compressor. And I thought, wait a minute, that's really smart because why would I want to even worry about gating sound that I don't want in, in the ever in the mix? So let's mm. get rid of the EQ of that. And then the same with the compressor. Why am I compressing this stuff that doesn't sound good? You know, why don't we tune it out first? And then of course, Neutron's cool because you can do an EQ on the other side of the compressor if you want. And you can, you can do it in any order you want. These are just these little blocks that you just drag around. And of course yeah. you can save all your presets. It's really cool. Uh, I've been using another thing from, from Isotope called ozone. It's, it's a mastering plugin or it's a separate app just for mastering. And again, now, do, you, do you know much about mastering and have you done much mastering on it? Cause that's kind of a black art, right? It, it sort of, it, it's, I mean, it's a black, anything's a black art until you start messing with it, but it, <laughs> but it, it is one of these black arts. Cause even if you've done some, like you could talk to somebody that does it completely differently, but generally the idea behind, and yes, I've done a little bit of mastering just for our own stuff. I've never, you know, contracted myself out or anything. I'm not anywhere near that level. In fact, I, I reached out to a pro sound guy, uh, or a pro, uh, recording engineer, and he's going to give me some lessons, but, um, nice. but I've been, but I've been taking lessons essentially from ozone. Now I used ozone seven several years ago when we did our last fling EP and I did not, uh, it, it just didn't work for me at the time. And now with ozone nine, man, like it is perfect. The whole idea behind mastering is to take your audio signal and, and, and fill it. One of the words I, I heard somebody use is in biggin, I n biggin, make the, 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 the audio fatter and fuller without, you know, distorting things or, or ruining the mix. Essentially, usually you're mastering from a two track finalized mix. And, um, and so you're, you're sort of, uh, with, you're using a lot of compression. You're using some limiting. Uh, you're using some some stereo imaging, and and uh, one of the things that Ozone really taught me was how some it, you know again you run it through these mix assistants and it shows you some examples uh, of what you could do. But using like a four band stereo imager, so you you can do a wider stereo image with the stuff, you know, for example, at the top end of the EQ spectrum and then less and less as you get down, if you want, you know, and, and, and maybe the stuff at the lower end, you, you want to take any stereo image out of it. You want that stuff all dead center, you know, because right. you want the kick in the bait. I mean, again, it's, you're the artist, you get to decide how to use it, but that's one way to do it. And I, I never would have thought of any of this without, without these plugins. So it, they, they've really come a long way. So a little gift from COVID. Yeah, well, that's it is I've got time. So might as well, you know, mess with some of this stuff. And they've got trials that you can use of their plugins and all that stuff. So I'll put some links in the show notes. But um, but so that's the software I've got. Do you, do you have anything yeah. to talk about? I've got hardware, too. So, I've, you know, I haven't I'm no stranger to buying stuff. Well, I have a couple of those warm audio mics that I'm excited mm. to try and play with. So, you know, my goal is to get better quality sound and a much more natural um, environment like so for my um hold on a sec yeah sure I, while you're doing your thing paul i'm going to tell them about the new uh the new 
control surface that I'm using this week because I, I mentioned in the past that I was using a different one. And this week I'm testing the Platform M Plus from Icon. And it's a USB control surface. It's actually got nine faders on it. Uh, eight of them can be assigned to tracks and then one is set to the master. Uh, welcome back, Paul. I'm telling him about the, the control surface that I have. And I, f I figure we'll circle back to you. Just had to block some, I had to do a little gating, a little gating. That's right. <laughs> Physical gating. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but this control surface that I have, it's the icon platform M plus eight, uh, nine motorized faders. Eight of them can be assigned to tracks and are sort of auto assigned when you plug them into your favorite DAW. And then there's a master track. And there's buttons for uh, selecting the track, mute and solo and record, and then a uh, potentiometer so that you can set like either effect levels or pan, uh, you know, amounts if you want to stereo pan with it or whatever. And then there's some simple shuttle controls on it for, you know, play, record, stop and those sorts of things. It, this one, it, it does all the things that you need. All the faders are motorized and it's like 420 bucks which is a third the price of most of the other control surfaces that I've yeah. been looking at. Yeah. And you know, like, would I use this in a totally pro studio? I mean, maybe like I can't find a reason why you wouldn't, but certainly in a home studio, something that's 400 bucks versus something that's 1200, you know, as I mentioned in a previous episode, I like to mix my podcast live. I, I like to have physical faders that I can grab, not digging through windows, and now that I'm using Logic to mix the show, I needed a control surface. And this platform M Plus, man, is awesome. It, I'm really cool. impressed with it, especially for the price. But I'm impressed any. So yeah, yeah, that's good. So I was saying that um, I have these warm audio. I have yeah. one large condenser and one small condenser mics. And you know, I'd like to keep looking for interesting ways to produce um, to produce my live streams. Better sound, certainly for sure. one. You know, uh, and so. Uh, I've got that. I just ordered um, an interesting, like a lav clip-on mic mm. that's uh, a Sennheiser mic that um, might be able to, well, it, it might be able to get a mic out of my face when I'm doing some of these things yeah. uh, live. And then also I'm kind of interested in doing more than just streams from my living room. Like, wouldn't it be nice to go to a park or go to the beach or you know, do something like that and just make, if, if these streams are going to be a thing, and now assuming that we can safely go to the house, but you right. know, these streams are going to be a thing, you know, seems like might be nice to take your viewers, you know, let them experience what your life is like wherever you may live. And, you know, th that might be a way to differentiate a stream if we're going to have to do streams, you know, until live music comes back. So I've got uh, that Sennheiser mic coming, that clip on mic. Um, I'm really interested also talking about you know, kind of remote stuff is in this new Zoom L8 mixer, which is a battery powered mixer, um, eight channels, um, full effects actually records to um, it's bus powered as well. Um, it uh, uh, records to SD right in the mixer. I mean, it, for, for 399 bucks, it seems like a ton of functionality. And that might be another part of the of the puzzle for being able to do huh. streaming stuff from wherever you go. So uh, that looks kind of cool. I want to check that out. Well, but and really I don't see, about with, the, with all this stuff, I mean, I don't see why the streaming needs to end when our ability to play live in front of you know crowds resumes I, I think the streams especially if you if you wind up putting a lot of energy into not just doing your streams but building your audience there i feel like there's a huge opportunity uh, you know to to keep that going once you yeah. once you start playing out live i you know well i mean th this goes back to our very interesting and evolving conversation about audiences and why right? are you streaming are you streaming to pass the time now are you trying to build wider audiences are you trying to hold on to your local audience are you are you trying to do both there's it's not right. an either or situation right um and so you know once people can go back out is does a saturday night stream still make sense Maybe not for your local crowd, but maybe for a wider crowd. And you know, yeah. how, how do you know? And so, it it uh, you become uh, an analytics person almost, right? You know, what is <laughs> yeah, the value? It's, it's data data driven streaming for your live exactly. band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it, over on Cover Band Central, they had a going back to our other conversation. Yeah. They had a pretty interesting conversation about about you know, will it be coming back? And there were a couple places, South Florida or something like that, that was starting to have bands, and you know fill things up overwhelmingly people were saying they didn't think live music was going to come back in 2020 
hoping for summer 2021. Yeah. I think in in a in a for bands and dancing in a wide in scale, I think that's probably right. Yeah, I mean, we might get our little, you know, like what we've talked about, you know, these these sort of fitting in the socially distanced puzzle gig issues kind of happening this year, maybe. Uh, but I think in a in a grand scheme of things, in New Year's Eve to me seems like maybe the earliest gig that that could be done at scale. Mm. So. Uh, but even that is like, I, I don't know, you know, but I don't think there's, I don't think anybody's going to be talking about fall tour this year. So. Yeah. Well, that's what Brad was saying. That's what, and that's what Brad was saying too. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. So there's one more piece of hardware that I have, Paul, and I, sh I want to share it just because I want you folks to tell us, you know, that we care about audio quality here. And on that note, Paul, I want to say whatever you've done with your setup there. You sound awesome today. Your mic. Oh, my buddy Dave great. told me to get closer on the mic, constantly, be more constantly closer. <laughs> so I use the the Hamilton method is really what has changed here. That's all that's changed. Okay, well, you sound yeah. fantastic today. You, and you the sounded, Hamilton directive. You sounded great uh, on the last show when we had Brad on too. I meant to say something, but uh, but yeah, it's really good. <laughs> no, my co-host threatened me. So I, well, there I, was uh, that. I, I'm, I'm, I, I I've heard of this. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, so I, I use and always have had a uh, Focusrite Scarlett 18i20 as my, my audio interface for my, my drums and that sort of thing. But I use eight, eight tracks of drums when I record. So all eight of my channels on that are, are filled. Now, previously, I was using a mixer, which was also an audio interface, a Behringer mixer that, that you know, was where my podcast mic would plug in while moving to this setup that I have now where my mixer is logic inside my computer. I needed more tracks, Paul. I couldn't possibly <laughs> even consider the idea of unplugging a drum and changing the gain. Like those need to stay where they are. And so I, I looked and you know, my bear, my, um, my focus, right. Audio interface has, um, optical inputs and outputs on the back of it for expansion uh, using the ADAT protocols, but it's the little toss link, you know, light pipe connectors like you might see on your Apple TV or, you know, old Apple TV or your television or whatever. It's the same little connectors and they are used to transmit um, audio. And so I added a Behringer ADA 8200 ADAT expansion unit, which is eight inputs and eight outputs. They've got Midas designed preamps on them. So it's, you know, it's step up from where you might start with Behringer. Yeah. I actually kind of like these preamps. I'm, I've been pretty impressed with, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to what I hear for my voice and the mic I use is a Heil PR 40. It requires a lot of gain. And this is able to give it, you know, enough gain that, that you folks can hear me and I can get kind of a nice warm sound out of it. So, uh, so I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with this. I, I, but I'm not finished, Paul. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I will, I will, I, I'm, I'm adding a Thunderbolt interface. I, as soon as they can make more of them, the uh, Personas, uh, I think it's the Quantum 2626 is what I'm going to add. And then I will use these other two as slaves and so I'll have 24 ins and outs here in the studio, which means I can get rid of all the mixers in the studio. And when the band comes over to rehearse, I'll be able to plug the band in and use logic as our live mixer. Nice. And, yeah. but, and then also record at the literally the push of a button when anytime we want to, if we want to just track something quick live. So, so anyway, this is, that's the, this is the path of insanity that I'm, that I'm on. And I'm, I'm as we have the time you. just to get to, you know, my, my days are, you know, my sleeves are rolled up on Final Cut and on yep. Logic and on Mimo Live and trying out new microphones. I got a, a Universal Audio Arrow. Um, That's right. The other yeah. day, which is really cool. And so, you know, my skill set is expanding. My technical knowledge on this stuff is expanding, and it's it's good. It's useful. It's 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 part of the evolution of what, you know what you need to do to. Prom I mean, I should have been better with Final Cut to begin with because. You know, video yeah. has largely surpassed handing someone a CD as a promo for your band. But, totally. Um, oh, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But but, but now's the time. Evolution. Yeah. No, now's it's good. Time. So that I, I know we talked about it in a, a couple of episodes ago, but that UA, the uh, Arrow interface, that's also a Thunderbolt interface, right? Yeah, it's a Thunderbolt interface. It's interesting. Like it's great for many things, and yeah. the plugins are really remarkable. I don't know if I have enough DSP power for for what I want to do. One of the things I really liked was they have a, a plugin that's a uh, it's called Capital Chambers, which is the mm. capital 
Capitol Records recording studios, you know, underneath ground, famous reverb you know, room. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it takes a ton of DSP and I'm not sure if I'll be able to use that in other things, which might, which might limit me a little bit. So I might need a bigger I, UA product. But. Right. Because those UA interfaces, for those who didn't hear the last episode or, or missed it, they have their own processors in them for exactly this kind of stuff so that your computer's processor can be left to do its own things. Yeah, I've, I've run into that, you know, using Logic Live to mix the show as I am. And I'm doing the same mm -hmm. with with uh, like the live streams that we're doing for Bitter Pill. I have to be really aware of how much CPU any given plugin is using. Uh, the other day I had a problem on the, the live stream with Bitter Pill. I mentioned some technical issues. Well, I had added Neutron 3 and I was using you know, two different compressors and, you know, three different EQs and all this stuff going on on one of the channels. And it, it was not happy with the, the way I had my buffering set up. And I was like, right, there's more to this now. I've, I've, I've tasked my computer with extra stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So those, those outboard processors that UA uses, like, that's great. Cause then you, you're not, you know, you're just, you're good to go. And Thunderbolt, I mean, they, they say it's like less than a millisecond latency, which is awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Cool. So, new toys. Geeky. More stuff I like all it. the time. And yeah. I'll keep reporting back, if you will, on the new stuff. Like I said, I'm, I'm waiting for the warm audio mics that I ordered to come in. I got one of mine, but I'll wait to talk about it until we can, until we, we can cool. have a mutual conversation about it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Cool. All right, folks. Well, I think that's going to, uh, I think that's going to do it for us. Unless you got anything else, Paul. No, I'm good, man. Good talking yeah. to you. Yeah. Good talking to you as always, my friend. I like doing this. I was sad to miss last week. I mean, it's good, you know, to take a week off. From every once in a while. Every now yeah. and then. Yeah, exactly. Not too right. often. Hey, dude. Yeah. Even when streaming. Yeah. Always be performing. Oh, right. Thank you. 